The interstellar medium is the gas between the stars, and there's almost nothing there. The average density in the interstellar medium is one particle, one atom per cubic centimeter. Uh, that's so tenuous that if you were to take just uh, a few liters of water and imagine putting it, and imagine that the Earth were hollow, and that you just put that few liters of water, you allow it to evaporate and fill the whole interior volume of the Earth, that would be the density of the interstellar medium. So there's almost nothing there. But this, the galaxy is so vast that actually there's a huge amount of mass in this very tenuous gas. And this gas has a number of different uh, parts. Uh, the most abundant part is uh, atomic hydrogen. Hydrogen is the most abundant element in the universe. And so it's no surprise that the most abundant thing that we see is just the uh, individual hydrogen atoms. And these atoms uh, can range in temperature from a order 100 degrees Kelvin to up to about 10,000 uh, degrees Kelvin. The atomic hydrogen was discovered uh, many years ago. It was first detected in the late 1940s. Uh, and the emission is very interesting. The hydrogen atom emits because there is a spin of the proton and a spin of the electron. And when they are spinning in parallel, that's actually slightly more energetic than when they're anti-parallel. So if you start off with a hydrogen atom in this state and then it goes to that state, it will emit a radiation at a wavelength of 21 centimeters, which is about that, that big. And astronomers or physicists uh, detected it in the uh, late 1940s. And now we have a huge amount of information about the hydrogen from very large radio telescopes. Another very important constituent of the interstellar medium is what astronomers call H2. Here the 2 is a Roman numeral 2, not the uh, a digit 2. And that's ionized gas. The gas is uh, mainly ionized by uh, very hot stars. A star like the Sun emits radiation that is peaked at about the wavelength that we see in our eyes. Uh, and the typical energy of a photon is, say, a couple of electron volts. However, when you get up to an energy of more than 13.6 electron volts, then the radiation is energetic enough to actually take the electron from the hydrogen atom and split it away so that you have a separate uh, electron and a proton. And this is then makes an H2 region. In order to do that, you need to have a star that's much hotter than the sun. And the temperatures of stars get larger and larger as the stars get more massive. So when you get to very large stars, such as in the trapezium nebula, uh, in, the, in the Orion nebula, you have stars that are up to about 40 times the mass of the sun, and they create the Orion nebula, which is uh, uh, visible by eye. Another important constituent, then, is actually even hotter gas. I should say that the H2 is typically temperature of around 10,000 degrees that there's hotter gas that is revealed by its X-ray emission. Uh, this uh, hot interstellar medium has a temperature of order a million degrees, and it's in rough pressure balance with the colder gas, so that means that since it's so much hotter, it must be much less dense, and the typical density might only be uh, a few thousandths of a particle per cubic centimeter. And this gas then pervades uh, a lot of the disk of the galaxy, but it also extends high up into the halo of the galaxy. In fact, we do not know how much of this hot gas there is far above the galaxy. It's possible that there's as much gas, hot gas, high above the halo as there is in the main disk of the galaxy. Then uh, perhaps one of the most important constituents of the interstellar medium is the molecular hydrogen. This gas is very cold. It typically has a temperature of only 10 degrees above absolute zero. It is uh, concentrated in clouds. Most of the gas is in what are called giant molecular clouds. When you can actually see these uh, visibly, if you look at a picture of the disk of the Milky Way, you'll see a band of stars. But there are all these dark patches in them. Those dark patches are generally regions where there's molecular gas. Now, you could say, well, why is it that the uh, uh, you have these dark patches. The gas itself, the molecular hydrogen, is not absorbing the radiation. It's transparent. And that's because you have a constituent of the interstellar medium which pervades 
all the different phases that I've been describing, and that's interstellar dust particles. Much of the heavy elements in the uh, interstellar medium, for example, like iron and silicon, uh, are primarily in solid particles. These solid particles are less than a micron in size. They essentially act like tiny little uh, particles of dirt, if you will. And as you know, dirt, sand, things like that are opaque. So you have these tiny particles. Their size is comparable to the size of the wavelength of visible light and ultraviolet light. And so those particles are very effective at absorbing light and you, it's dark. As you go to longer wavelengths, so if I have a little teeny particle, I'm exaggerating here, but imagine the distance between my fingers is a, a size of a particle. But the wavelength of my radiation is much bigger then the radiation does not interact very strongly with the particle and it can penetrate through. And so then in order to study these uh, molecular clouds, we use observations in the infrared region of the spectrum where the wavelength is longer. Many of the infrared wavelengths are blocked by the Earth's atmosphere. So it's been particularly important to be able to use satellites in space, such as the uh, recent um, Spitzer satellite that NASA uh, launched several years ago that has made a lot of studies of star forming regions in the infrared. But I was showing you if a particle was this big, then the infrared wavelengths are this big. Radio wavelengths are far bigger. As I mentioned, in real units, the radio wavelength is, uh, say, for atomic hydrogen, is this big. To study molecular gas, you actually want to have uh, wavelengths that are order a millimeter or a few millimeters in size. Uh, but then in that case, you would have to have the dust grain would be too small uh, to be seen, and its real size is only about less than a micron. So radio astronomers have been studying these giant molecular clouds for decades, and they have identified many molecules. The most abundant molecule, of course, is molecular hydrogen. And unfortunately, as I said, a molecular hydrogen is transparent. It's almost impossible to observe, uh, to observe. Certainly, you cannot observe it uh, from the ground. In space, if the hydrogen is hot enough, then you can see it in the infrared. But it, you cannot see it in the optical and the infrared we can see from the ground or in the radio. So instead, astronomers use the next most abundant molecule in these molecular clouds, and that's carbon monoxide, which is just one carbon atom joined with one uh, oxygen atom. And they can map out all the molecular gas in the galaxy using this uh, CO. And they find that the, dense, the typical density in these molecular clouds is thousands of particles per cubic centimeter. So it's still an extremely hard vacuum by Earth standards, but very dense compared to the typical density of the atomic hydrogen. And as I mentioned, the temperature of this molecular hydrogen is of order uh, 10 uh, degrees Kelvin. So, I mentioned that there have this, uh, this dust pervades all these different phases. Another, there are a couple of other things that pervade the interstellar medium also. Uh, one is magnetic fields. Uh, it's well known that the magnetic field on the Earth, for example, is about half a gauss. The typical magnetic field in the interstellar medium is uh, about almost 100,000 times weaker than that, uh, five or six microgauss. When you get into the molecular clouds, then the magnetic field can be somewhat stronger. Another uh, constituent that pervades the interstellar medium is cosmic rays. These cosmic rays were discovered on the Earth uh, early in the uh, 20th century. As uh, people went up in balloons, they noticed that the rate of ionization uh, increased. And now we know, understand that these cosmic rays pervade the entire galaxy. So you could ask, why is it that the uh, different constituents of the interstellar medium have the temperatures that they do. The uh, temperature of space of the universe is about 2.7 degrees Kelvin. That's the temperature of the cosmic microwave background. So why doesn't everything just cool down to that? Well, if you look at the atomic hydrogen that I talked about at first, and as I mentioned, it has this dust that's embedded in it. This hydrogen is heated primarily by starlight. Starlight, uh, is, uh, particularly in the ultraviolet, is absorbed by these dust grains. And when an ultraviolet photon comes in and hits a dust grain, it will eject an electron. And that electron carries energy with it, which then heats up the gas. 
So that's the dominant heating mechanism for the uh, neutral gas. If you get to the ionized gas, as I mentioned, that is also heated by starlight, but in this case, by the radiation, which is more than 13.6 electron volts. So uh, what is the um, origin of the interstellar medium? The uh, gas in the uh, universe was accreted into galaxies, and this is how galaxies are formed. Most of that gas has uh, gone into stars. But we still have gas left in the interstellar medium. This gas is gradually being converted to stars itself. It is believed that there is a continual flow of gas into the halo of our galaxy from the intergalactic medium, and that this gas then is also very gradually accreting into the galaxy. So the galaxy is growing, albeit uh, very slowly now. And uh, this gas starts off and it can be quite hot, but then it cools off uh, when it uh, joins the galaxy. Some of the main questions that we want to understand about the interstellar medium is to try to get a much better understanding of this cycle that I uh, described where I had starlight uh, that was produced by the stars, heating, energizing the gas, then having the gas uh, forming stars. We need to understand this whole life cycle in uh, much more detail. How much of this hot gas is there? there if you ask uh, how many uh, baryons there are in the galaxy and compare that with the amount of uh, dark matter, we're actually missing uh, the, a lot of baryons. And the scale of the universe as a whole, the, there's about uh, 20 or 25 percent of the uh, uh, dark matter mass is actually in baryonic mass. But in our galaxy, it's less. Where did those baryons go? Some of them could be in hot gas. Some of that hot gas could be in the halo of our galaxy. And it's believed that some of the gas actually is not even, has been blown out of the galaxy and is uh, now uh, in the intergalactic medium. But we don't have a very good uh, understanding of that gas yet because it's very hard to detect. It's very, uh, has very faint X-ray emission and it's difficult to measure the uh, X-ray absorption lines that it produces. There's also gas at cooler temperatures like at of order 10,000 degrees there and that gas can be studied by using ultraviolet observations from instruments such as the Hubble Space Telescope. So in the uh, future, it's hoped that with uh, much more extensive studies of this extra emitting gas, we'll be able to get a much better handle on uh, the, its nature and abundance in the, in the galaxy.